do that. Can yep. you copy okay. them? And Thank you. The final session of this afternoon will be a session with um, uh, seven speakers on stage. And uh, the speakers are uh, Lucy Guibault from uh, the Institute for Information Law, University of Amsterdam, Patrick Pfeiffer from Luxembourg, Lux Commons, uh, Jonathan Gray from the Open Knowledge Foundation, Shirin Tekinai from Oziagin University, Ignazi Labastida from the University of Barcelona, Philippe Grain again remains on stage, uh, and uh, Paolo Lanteri from WIPO in Geneva. Now, as they as they assemble on uh, on stage, I will say you why they are convening, and uh, they are going to try in the little time uh, and with the little energies that we have left uh, to present you an overview of the main points uh, that were discussed during the past almost three years of the Comunia project. As I t told you at the beginning, when we introduced this conference, the Comunia project uh, started. Uh, at the end of 2007, and uh, this is the 12th meeting. So we had 11 meetings uh, uh, before, and uh, we met uh, all over Europe uh, discussing different aspects uh, of the public domain, technological, economic, memory institutions in the public domain, and, uh, and public sector information is a crucial component of the public domain. So now the, the people on stage, which I strongly invite to sit down, please. Please. And uh, they're, going to, um, they're going to present you the takeaway points, uh, the insight that we collectively uh, produced during this almost three years uh, of a uh, European project. So, Lucy, may I give the word to you? You can start sitting. Thank you. Uh, and uh, as they sit down, let me repeat that uh, on the Comunia project website, uh, there, is, uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of uh, video, audio materials, slides, papers, uh, all of them, almost all of them, with a uh, very liberal license that allows quotation, copying, and so on, in case you're interested in any of the topics that we'll, you will hear summarized during this session. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lucie Guivaud. I'm, I work at the Institute for Information Law at the University of Amsterdam. And it's, um, well, you may wonder why we're searching for the public domain in this very last session of the second day of this conference. And I think the link with the previous session is very obvious because, um, well, we were just now uh, examining universities as creators of knowledge, but we have to all realize that the building blocks of knowledge is everything that's in the public domain. And this is precisely what the Comunia Network has been working on for three years, all dedicated people meeting periodically for workshops and conferences and working very hard in between to produce several types of output uh, ranging from uh, well discussion reports to slides to uh, policy recommendations will be which will be made public in the course of the year and um, a public domain manifesto uh, which I will uh, describe in, in a few minutes um, I'm not officially the uh, session leader, as other panels had, but I was invited by Juan Carlos to uh, act as facilitator uh, to this session, and I think my main role will be to keep us all within the time so that we can go have dinner all together later on tonight. And, well, not that I want to be impolite, but I think I will start with my own five minutes before um, I give the, uh, after that, I will give the floor to Patrick Pfeiffer here um, next to me. He will talk about uh, public domain calculators and all the work that has been done on that subject. After that, uh, Jonathan Gray will be talking about um, public sector information. Um, hello, just on time, yes. Um, after Jonathan, we'll invite uh, Cyril Tekine uh, to talk about um, open educational resources. 
Um, there we will have uh, Ignasi Labastida to talk about research and open access. There, uh, Philippe Begrin, who we um, just listened to uh, in the previous session. And we will finish uh, with uh, Paolo Lantiri for the uh, World Intellectual Property Organization. And he will talk about the development agenda and the meaning of the public domain in this context. So, I've been allowed to talk to you about five minutes or less. <laughs> Um, of uh, the work that has been done in work group six, um, just to, uh, as a parenthesis, all uh, the participants or the communion members were at the very beginning d separated into working groups uh, with different subjects. Uh, working group one was educational uh, or uh, science and research. Uh, there was an economics uh, working group, a technological working group, um, a cultural heritage institutions working group with uh, Martin Brinkerink also. Um, number five uh, was Philippe Egrin's uh, working group. And working group number six was uh, mapping public domain. And this is the working group I was in. So the purpose... Um, of this working group is actually overreaching all other working groups. And this is why, although I don't want to be impolite, I give myself the word first. The idea was, since we're all busy with the public domain and we'll be, well, when we started off uh, three years ago, we thought, well, we'll be busy with the public domain for three years. We should at least try to define what it is. What are we talking about? And besides that, once we know approximately what we mean by the public domain, what do we want to achieve? What are the principles um, that are so important to us that we would like to put them in a document to be remembered uh, in the coming years? So this was actually the work of Working Group 6. And um, the, I think, most tangible output of Working Group 6 was the publication in January of the Public Domain Manifesto. And you may have um, seen it circulate on the internet. It has been signed by, well, I don't know what the latest numbers were, but way over 2,000 um, individuals and uh, entities. Um, and the Public Domain Manifesto is actually this. It provides a definition of the public domain which we uh, qualified in two. First, the structural public domain, meaning everything that is no longer or never has been protected by copyright, meaning all the, uh, the works that were uh, in the past protected by copyright, but the protection has expired, or all types of information that is not original, of, uh, original enough to uh, uh, be eligible for copyright protection. Now, this is uh, what we call the structural public domain. And this we, we also completed by the vol voluntary or the functional public domain, um, which includes um, all the, the works that are being voluntary, voluntarily put into the public domain by their authors and all the acts that can be done pursuant to the uh, copyright uh, limitations and exceptions such uh, as fair use in the United States. Now, this was the broad definition that we provided, um, which is very encompassing. And then we uh, set out uh, some general principles uh, in the public domain manifesto. I think the number one uh, principle was uh, public domain is the rule and copyright is the exception. It's a very bold statement, but this is uh, actually the basis of uh, the, the, the free flow of information principle, meaning that um, copyrighted material is, in the scheme of things, uh, an exception because most information out there is not uh, original uh, enough to be pr uh, copyright protected. Now, I won't uh, go into the details of all the uh, general principles. You can read it uh, on the internet, www public domain manifesto altogether.org. But the good thing is, and that should be mentioned, is that um, this gave rise to more discussions outside of Communia Network, 
and led to the adoption by Europeana of a Europeana public domain charter, which is greatly inspired by the uh, Manifesto of Comunia, but which is more targeted to public domain um, uh, pub, uh, cultural heritage institution, excuse, and well, which mainly focuses on the structural public domain and not the voluntary public domain. So, since my five minutes are up, I give the word to Patrick. Thank you. Uh, I took some notes to be able to neatly fit a year of work within the two minutes. Uh, I'll, I'll do my best. I will uh, talk mainly about calculators, although I was not all that heavily involved in the work leading up to calculators. So what, what is a public domain calculator? The idea is you feed it some data and it gives you the answer, yes, this work is in the public domain or not, plus all the gazillion of gray shades in between the yes and no. Uh, why would you do that? Uh, very simply, the public domain status changes every year, so you know, it's good to have a mechanism where you can update the status of works, and of course there's a, a large amount of works for which this information is not readily available. The Working Group 6 did uh, fantastic foundational work for calculators, and uh, what I'm really, really happy about is that the Working Group 6 managed to uh, ensure that their work is carried forward within uh, Euro another project called Europeana Connect and by the Open Knowledge Foundation. So the calculator project is going very strongly and although Comunia is ending, we will actually expand it to 30 jurisdiction by the end of 2011 where we have structured uh, decision trees, maps and legal analysis available. One application of public domain calculators, and that's my first sidetracking uh, of calculators, is publicdomainday.org, another, I think, completely undervalued Comunia uh, achievement. And uh, compliments go out to the, the Polish members who have worked really hard to turn it into sort of a project out of the box just by selecting a culturally relevant work for a specific country that will go into the public domain inviting a well-known artist to recite it, in the case of a poem, inside the National Library in early January. And it's just such a simple and fantastic way to reach an audience with the subject of the public domain, which you would normally never reach, but which I think really is the audience that you need to reach to raise awareness about the public domain. So back to the calculators. I think that calculators really are sort of a 21st century uh, rights management tool and particularly rights clearance tool. I don't think that uh, the way rights have been cleared in the 20th century work anymore in the 21st century, notably because we have this avalanche of digitized work that's coming in and just uh, how to handle that you need some sort of automated process. The calculators all also show the way towards a more uh, dynamic, sort of uh, computational, as in Wolfram Alpha, sort of uh, rights interface. And they truly, I hope, will live up to what they can do to calculators when you can let them lose on large amounts of linked bibliographic data, like freely available bibliographic data. Of course, I'm from a library, so I have a slight bias towards libraries. This also includes uh, data from museums, for example, and then have the public calculators, uh, public domain calculators work on this data and provide, hopefully, a huge benefit and demonstrate that there is a benefit in opening up data as well because you can do something with this data which you don't have to, neither have to pay for nor have to invest resources in. And there comes a plea if you know of any other concrete examples of benefits for opening up your data, please uh, let me or us know because we're really looking for those. We really need them to convince people to do that. So likewise, if you're interested in the public domain calculators work, uh, get in touch with uh, Jonathan, Lucy or me. How much more time do I have? One minute. Oh my God. One thing that points to the future uh, for the public domain is something that we found out in talking to a lot of the institutions or a lot of the institutions that are represented in Comunia. One 
finding of working group three was that there is a huge amount of domain differences and even in the same domain there's a widely different missions and objectives that these institutions have and trying to convince them or make an argument for them that they should release not only their metadata but also their works into the public domain usually was going around in circles around the legal argument that the copyright has expired, there is no more protection on it, uh, please don't be a copy fraudster, don't limit it, etc. And it has turned out that this purely legalistic way of approaching them doesn't really work in many cases. And I, I must include myself in that working in a national library, I'm not really convinced of it. So I think there's a lot of scope to enlarge the discussion a little bit and not only talk about the legal reason for why you should open up public domain content as public domain, but also take into account the sort of intangible, non-contractual uh, reasons which will facilitate that. For example, please link back to us when we have invested so much in it. Don't break the links. Uh, please use it in a, in a respectful manner. Make sure that uh, end users will always find the authentic digital copy, etc of all sorts of things which are not contractual, so which would still be within the public domain manifesto and importantly for Europeana within the public domain charter, but still sort of make it easier for these institutions to release their content as public domain. And uh, I end with that. Okay, I'm going to try and give a comically quick uh, introduction to uh, open government data and its relationship to Communia and the public domain. Um, so basically, uh, as with, with uh, open government data, as with many other areas of knowledge, we're still making this transition from books to bits. That is, uh, rivalrous, uh, physical, the rivalrous physical transmission of knowledge to uh, non-rivalrous uh, electronic transmission. Um, we're kind of uh, moving from large silos of um, sort of information produced by government slowly towards um, easy to reuse chunks which can be built upon or visually represented or plugged into other sources of data. Uh, we're moving slowly from this kind of situation which we have at the moment which is um, unclear, you know, legal uncertainty around whether you can use government information or not to, um, in several countries, a big green light which is what we really want, letting people know that they can use the material for any purpose. Um, and that it's open data. Um, also, there have been moves around the world to um, open up the raw underlying data, um, which is usually kind of processed and published in documents. Um, just to take a quick step back, um, why do we care and how, does, how do these kind of recent developments sort of play out within the context of Communia? Um, well, I guess from a European perspective, um, uh, the information programme is since the late 90s been interested in the fact that European PSI is estimated to be worth uh, 27 billion euros um, and I guess so sort of this is uh, partly looking towards geospatial data markets in the US um, also there's obviously social benefits but I think you know as we'll maybe talk about later some of these are sort of underrepresented at a European level um, the transparency accountability improved public service provision um, external expertise and finally building a sort of dynamic two-way relationship between citizens and public bodies so here's a sort of uh, example. I mean, this is a long shadow historically. Uh, this is from turn of the century Vienna, um, kind of trying to represent sort of public information. I guess, you know, the more information we have in society, the greater the demand for representing it in intuitive ways. Um, this is another kind of early example of a mashup, uh, looking at senators and representatives of the US. Uh, here's a more recent example from the OKF, which is uh, where does my money go, showing where uh, public information is spent, public money is spent in the UK. Um, Here's an example kind of mashing up uh, public transport with house prices so you can see where you can afford to live to get to work within a certain amount of time. And here's um, you know, an unexpected reuse which is uh, crime statistics made into a sculpture. Um, obviously, you know, with the growth of, sort of public sector information, uh, there's increasing opportunity for sort of delivering uh, this information in um, sort of ways which are increasingly personalised and localised, uh, such as parliamentary records, uh, kind of available via postcode or by topic. Um, this is another service giving people information about uh, planning applications near them. And of course, there are sort of attempts to link together lots of data sources together. Um, at Communio Workshop 5 uh, in sort of April 2009, um, 
we gathered over 40 recommendations about sort of, uh, public sector information, public sector data and content, including th things like um, making um, digital PSI available at marginal cost, um, freeing data, uh, particularly including sort of, um, geographic information, and building relationships between civil servants and uh, community networks. Um, since that workshop, there's been an explosion of open government data initiatives around the world. Here are just a few of them. Um, we were involved in the construction of data.gov.uk, which is a portal showing you know, what open data is available for people to reuse. Um, and I'm happy to say that you know, some of this has come to bear fruit. I mean, on Friday, we had uh, the new government in the UK sort of announcing that public data will be released under the same open license, uh, which enables free reuse, including commercial reuse, and public data will be freely available to use in any lawful way. Um, and again, you know, back to one of the other recommendations, they're, they're kind of going to actively engage sort of uh, reusers. I mean, that's... So I'll talk about open educational resources because my institution was the proud host of the eighth and final Communia workshop on this topic. But before I do so, since I can't fight the uh, name of the workshop being uh, always remembered with the volcanic ash cloud covering all of Europe, I'll join everybody else. And I'll talk about the volcanic ash cloud. You'll think this has nothing to do with open educational resources, but bear with me, it has everything to do with the very theme of this conference and eventually what universities are supposed to do with it. As you can imagine, when you're putting together an international workshop and there is a volcano standing in your way between yourself and the very guests that you're expecting to host, you look at the map, the interactive tracking map of this thing, frantically, maniacally, at all times, which I did. And then I started to think about what goes into constructing these interactive maps, how often they get their updates, because at first, naively, I thought, well, isn't this thing over the earth? It's a natural disaster. Well, it wasn't a disaster after all, a natural occurrence. And can't they just track it by looking at things from the satellites? Well, I was naive. Apparently, there is tremendous amount of multidisciplinary collaboration going on between authorities, transportation authorities, meteorologists of many different countries that needs to go on for this map to be accurately constructed and presented at all times. Well, I'm proud to report to you that the ash cloud never made it to Turkey because it couldn't make it past the customs across the Bulgarian border. It stopped right there along the Bulgarian border between Turkey and Bulgaria, which was very convenient indeed. Now this is extremely reminiscent of everything else that we're talking about, such as copyright laws being updated, open educational resources being embraced. We have cultural, not just technical, but cultural and policy um, obstacles in our way to making this happen. Appropriately so, the keynote speech of the workshop was delivered by the wonderful professor James, uh, James Boyle, who um, titled his keynote speech, The Glorious Revolution of Open Educational Resources, exclamation mark, and then in parenthesis, and why it didn't happen yet. And we talked about many obstacles along the way, which was a nice way to set the tone for the rest of the workshop. Now, I won't go through the agenda of the workshop, but I can tell you that uh, my colleague from Slovenia, Maja Bogatáš, put together a very nice session on copyright, harmonization of copyright and copyright management. Um, and there were many different uh, viewpoints from across Europe and Turkey that were expressed. Maya could not make it to the workshop either, but the, 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 um, nevertheless, the uh, session was there. Um, other issues were open courseware and then the route from open courseware to open educational resources as the more uh, general overarching theme 
that talks to the very foundation of universities and the new role of universities. Uh, we talked about the Turkish perspective. We talked about open educational resources as a bridge to the Middle East and uh, developing countries in general. But what happened with the ash cloud on um, informing the society, the, the global interactive uh, information that we needed versus what happened with the actual um, workshop was dramatic. You find government and government institutions in the way of open sharing of information and then you have our little university that transported the workshop from a physical to a virtual one in no time. I was very proud of our IT guys who said, no problem, we'll just build capacity here and do this and it was going to be webcast anyway and we're going to take the questions over this line, that line and the other. I couldn't begin to follow what they were saying, they, and I'm an engineer, um, and, and they just did the transition from physical to virtual in no time and the workshop proudly covered everything that it was supposed to cover. I'm not saying this to brag, I know I'm bragging a little bit, but I'm saying this to underline what Charles Nesson said yesterday about the stakeholders and the governors at the internet being governments, businesses, and universities, but the universities being the foundation, the institutional foundation of it all. And therefore, as Professor Rodota said yesterday, we're the stewards as universities of knowledge. We have to bring the technical codes together with that of the law and not in the criminal law sense, but the constitutionalism that guarantees freedoms. Um, if I can focus for just two minutes on uh, open educational resources specific recommendations that came out of our workshop. Um, Technical issues, by the way, there were slide casts, uh, which we're very grateful for from uh, Creative Commons, from Nathan Yergler, from Yoris, from Francis, um, talking about infrastructure that's needed, uh, the technical problems that we're facing with open educational resources. But in the um, gr grand picture of the obstacles along the way, technical issues seem to be secondary and as an engineer I think I have a license to say this because everyone thinks their piece of the puzzle is the most important. Um, uh, open educational resources are foundational to presenting the uh, very meaning, uh, the historic meaning of universities which resides at the um, information generation level and that's precisely in the heart of uh, the intersection of research and education. And um, the new role of universities, which encompasses not just being a center, but being central to um, e-learning and uh, lifelong learning, formal and informal learning. Um, and along the way, we need to keep on top of, by we I mean universities, on top of policy makers and influence the culture in the meantime. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, let's go for my five minutes. <laughs> uh, what, what I want to explain is a little bit what we have seen from our working group that finally we merged with Philip's working group, working group five. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about education because Sirin has already done. So we have, we, what we have seen these three years related to education and science is a lot of advances in openness, as we've seen today, uh, a lot of open access policies, mandates, not just from universities, but also from funding institutions, for that institutions that fund research. We have seen a lot of growing the number of repositories. We have seen all the, data opening, data experimental, that data, uh, scientific data. We have seen a lot of educational resources projects, open educational resources, but I would like to focus on some of the problems we have seen or some of the threats related with public domain, universities and uh, education and science. On one hand, we've seen a lot of universities engage in digitalization projects, especially in public domain works that once they digitize these works, they 
use copyright to enclose these public domain works. That's something that it really worries us from the point of view of the working group. Another thing that we have seen is some attempts of narrow all the exceptions and limitations in the law, especially in education and research and libraries, of course. Uh, we think that universities should face uh, these attempts and they should play an active role defending such exceptions because we need that accept those exceptions just to work as a university, to function as a university. And finally, we have seen a problem also within the universities. Many, many universities are signing declarations for openness, uh, the well-known Berlin Declaration or the Cape Town Declaration. What we decided as working group is to use yet another declaration, the Wheeler, the Wheeler Declaration that was uh, made by the uh, students for free culture in Berkeley. And we decided to use that declaration to make a tool for universities to see how open they are. What we decided is to make an online survey that is available from the wiki of our working group in the Comunia page, not just to rank universities, not it wasn't our idea to rank the universities, but to help universities to see how open they are. Because we think that openness sh should be something really strategical for a university and global, not just in research, not just in education. We think that it's important also software, patents, technology, everything. If you want to really establish an open university, you should face all that. So our idea, the, the survey is there, is open. I invite any people involved with universities to feel and to check the, and we are open for suggestions. And the idea is just not to receive the, the, the answers from universities, but to give them feedback and best practices to see what other people do. So I think that there is a lot to do and there is a lot to share, a lot of experiences to share. I again, uh, the, the technology for the public domain workshop of Comunia was, was the first workshop of the, of the network. It was in January 2008 and we co-organized it with Nexa and the aim was sort of to taking stock of the state of technology but either try to make the public domain more accessible or to make use of it more productive or uh, more safer also. And uh, it's fair to say that probably if we, if we would, would do it now, we would not do it the same way. First of all, we, we, for instance, uh, at the time we sort of took for granted uh, the existence of uh, an adequate information infrastructure. We, 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 we took for granted that we had, you know, we had computers, we had free and open source software, we had a neutral internet, a reasonably uh, uh, open hardware, uh, and we focused on access to, to data, to information, to works. To, and uh, I think if we do it today, maybe we would pay a little more attention to freedom in the cloud, to reclaiming servers and data, uh, to uh, network neutrality, to, to the condition of existence of practices that use the public domain. But let's not redo history. Fortunately, the work of the, uh, on technology for the public domain did not stop at that workshop. It went on for the full life of the project. And it really, it, it, its main points were things like public domain registries, things that try to certify and that works are actually in the public domain. Uh, and so as to enable safety uh, in their usage, very important factor for risk adverse organizations. And, uh, but also everything that was just mentioned, uh, public domain calculators, uh, 
uh, the registry of registries and directories of open data and related access technologies, all the wonderful work that was done uh, by the Open Knowledge Foundation for, for access, to, access to government and, and public sector and heritage organization data. Uh, one important output so far uh, of Comunia was to stress that the public domain is not just a, a, a source of information and knowledge, it can be a, a tool to, to derive new knowledge. And for that, we need, uh, actually, we need new tools. We need new technology. We new, need new methods. Uh, uh, Comunia was not a project to produce these tools, but we, we paid uh, strong attention to them, uh, in particular, perfect, in particular, uh, science commons and the efforts to uh, use sem semantic web technologies to derive, uh, if possible, new knowledge in some fields, uh, and also tools for, for the humanities because the heritage uh, organization were a prominent factor. Now, I must say that if I may say something for the future, that nobody from the European Commission is here to listen to, uh, but I'm sure they are all watching the stream. <laughs> uh, if it is now allowed to watch streaming on the European Commission computers, which was not allowed when I was there. Uh, but uh, if they do, uh, and if they don't, we will tell them. Uh, if we want to uh, make evident by usage what is the value of a public domain, uh, which I, I, we read the figure that it was worth 27 billion, but I think the important thing uh, uh, is uh, to whom? I mean, it's worth that for whom? And of course, what we want is that it is worth for European citizens, it's worth for scholarly communities, it's worth for producing new knowledge, new innovation, and that the proof is in the cake, the proof is in the usage. But if we want to make a network like that at a collective level useful for producing uh, new usage, then we need maybe a project of a slightly different kind in terms of what means it can mobilize. And I conclude on that. Good evening. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, let me start by assuring, uh, reassuring the audience that uh, I will leave you for make it for dinner tonight, uh, and uh, even if uh, I dress like, uh, uh, I look like an international civil servant, uh, you are not about to listen to a typical uh, WIPO style presentation, which I will just give you details on past project and how, like, general statement. I will stick to the time it was allotted to me, which is, I understood, six minutes and a half. And also to the program, uh, to the program, we are here to take stock of uh, the, the achievement of the Communia project. We are not here to talk about the achievement of WIPO. So I think it's important to highlight that uh, uh, among all the participants in this panel, I am the only one representing an organization which is not part of the Communia network. So I will, give, I will share with you ideas from a, an external perspective and uh, precisely from a perspective of uh, an international organization that has been asked by its member state to develop work activities, uh, in research activities, awareness raising activities, and also norm setting activities on, this, on the same targeted topic by, uh, like, uh, which is the focus of the Comunia project, uh, that is the public domain in its broader meaning. In that sense, uh, I think it can be argued that uh, with many differences, WIPO Secretariat and Comunia members are sharing uh, the same challenge, same challenges, at least I can see two of them. The first one is to raise awareness of the importance of this issue, and second, to provide tools for developing uh, policy guidelines. Uh, with that in mind, uh, uh, WIPO has participated in many events, most of the events of the Comunia project since its inception. And we can be defined using an international, a WIPO standard jargon as permanent observer to your process, sort of a permanent observer. And um, why is that? Uh, I, can, I can share with you a first-hand experience of what WIPO 
is done in the field of uh, public domain. Despite the fact that I joined WIPO less than three years ago, in fact, I joined WIPO July 2007, and at that time, the word public domain was not included in any work plan or agenda to be undertaken by the Secretariat. It was in the air, of course, because there were proposals to set up the development agenda by Argentina and Brazil. There were like provisional committees. But we had to wait till September 2007, when the General Assembly formally approved and established the, general, the, the development agenda, which is basically a set of 45 recommendations. That includes two of them, which is 16 and 20, that gives us a clear mandate to develop work on the public domain. And that I was there, and that uh, my first official mission was to Torino, to the first uh, Comunia workshop. It was uh, the fall of 2007. And it's clear, it's clear, it's evident, uh, I mean, to uh, everyone, that uh, three years has passed, but many, many changes have occurred, have occurred like uh, incredible changes. Now we have in our work plan, uh, uh, we just released a scoping study on the, on the public domain and related rights, uh, no, a scoping study on the public domain in the copyright and related rights field, which has been uh, uh, authored by Severin Dusolier, which is an active member of, uh, of Comunia. Uh, to understand uh, those, uh, those changes and uh, I think to make a link uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, the goals and objective of uh, a project such as the Comunia one, uh, it's important to have a look of what is happening in the international environment at the moment. Uh, uh, what are the governments trying to achieve in the uh, norm setting bodies, in those, uh, at least from uh, in the framework of multilateral intergovernmental organization that are basically are WIPO and UNESCO, if we want to, to, to close the cycle. And uh, in the last decades, um, a major change has occurred. Uh, the, the focus of governments in terms of political commitment, in terms of uh, uh, resources and time spent is no longer uh, to raise the level of protection, copyright, is no longer to uh, enforce copyright. Uh, in our agenda, uh, in the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights, the main object of the agenda, the main issue, is limitation and exception. And uh, we have been, like last week, we, uh, we had the, the, the 20th section of the CCR, and I can say, if you read the report, 80% of the discussion, the time spent, was focus on a proposal, a treaty proposed, uh, proposal for, on limitation and exception, mostly for the benefit of the visually impaired person, but it's already a big change and there were like ad additional proposal and calls for extending this exception to other kind of disabilities and there is a general uh, tendency to, to open up uh, a discussion regarding a possible uh, instrument soft law or hard law <laughs> instrument uh, is something different uh, on limitation exception uh, as a broad uh, area. Um, heading to, towards the, the conclusion of my brief intervention, it's, it's really, uh, unfortunately, I cannot give you, I, we don't have time, but I'm happy to answer your question, uh, even outside this, uh, this panel. And so just to conclude, in this, new and really fertile international context, I think that projects uh, like, uh, Comu like Comunia are uh, mostly appropriate and strategic uh, for the international community and uh, probably um, are going to be even more uh, effective and influential than what we could even think about, like uh, foresee a year ago, or like two years ago or something like that. And so the international community is looking forward uh, to your last outputs and uh, that I understand are going to be released soon. And, uh, and also, I personally have mm, no doubt that you will uh, meet uh, the high expectation of the international community in achieving your goals because uh, that are raise awareness, you are already doing that and you are doing that very well. Uh, providing tools for developing policy guidelines as well and the network uh, objective is, is already built. I think there are no doubt that it's already built. Thank you very much.
Well, since I'm the facilitator and not the official uh, session leader, I would like to facilitate, it, uh, facilitate questions from the floor. So if you have any questions on, on our activities for the past three years, the floor is yours. If not, Jonathan has a comment. I'd just like to say that kind of pulling together some of the threads that have sort of been discussed, um, particularly, I guess, with respect to sort of um, a bibliographic metadata in the public domain, I think um, continuing the work on the public domain calculators will be extremely valuable. Um, hopefully from the Europeana, if all goes, you know, if all goes well, then we'll have a sort of lovely, tremendous amount of, sort of bibliographic metadata, which will help us to um, have a sense of what is in the public domain and what is not in the public domain in different countries. But I think in addition to that, um, just from the point of view of sort of open government data and PSI, um, the, 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 sort of I had two, two brief points. One is that um, cultural heritage data is usually excluded from PSI directive. Um, and I think that even though you know, that, that may be as it is, starting to think more systematically about the extent to which cultural heritage data is shared um, will be extremely valuable for the future of the public domain in the European context, um, both in figuring out where, where it is and how, <laughs> how big it is, um, but also um, helping people to use it and creating innovation around sort of material that's in the public domain. Uh, the second thing is that um, I think there is a lot of scope for building on existing public sector information initiatives. I mean, I know that uh, there is a lot of momentum and exciting, excitement at the moment around the world. Uh, now really feels like the time, you know, especially with um, all of the things that have been happening in the US and the UK and Australia and New Zealand. I think a lot of countries are starting to become interested in sort of doing scoping work on public sector information. I think the opportunity for Communia is in pushing beyond um, the scope of the PSI directive and its focus on the economic value of public sector information and pushing for a broader sense of the value of public sector information, which is, I think, something that we were alluded to uh, briefly earlier, that, that it's not just the economic value, it's the value to society in a broader sense. And this will include things which we don't yet see enough of, such as sort of the next generation of digital services that will enable citizens to communicate with the public bodies around them. I'd like to correct a stupid thing I said, uh, uh, which uh, when I said that we we hope uh, to develop va uh, to, that value will, will be delivered to European citizens. Actually, I think it's stupid to restrict it in that manner, uh, even if it was not my intention. It's just my, my feeling uh, of being a European citizen. But regarding the public domain, value sh should be delivered to every human being on, on the planet and not uh, just those of Europe. And the best service we can make to to European citizen is to install Europe as a deliverer of value to uh, on, on, on delivering access to knowledge for, for the rest of the world also. Well, since there are no questions from the, from the audience. Uh, well, may I just say something before? Yeah, you'll be the next in line. Um, in the very beginning of Comunia, I felt a bit sorry that, um, well, there was not so much attention paid to public sector information. Um, when we were trying to define what is the public domain, public sector information was in my mind because in some countries, like the US, it's totally excluded from copyright protection. In other countries, like the UK, it is absolutely copyright protected. Even in continental Europe, it is also uh, copyright protected. So I thought there was a lot of work to be done towards uh, excluding this part of uh, documents and information from copyright protection to have it uh, circulate as much as possible. So, well, I'm happy that uh, Jonathan raised the issue. The only thing that, I'm, that comforts me f from the work that was not achieved within Comunia is that we now have the LAPSI project and Juan Carlos is also in charge. Uh, together with Professor uh, Ricolfi of the LAPSI project. And I hope that you guys will also pick up the question of all the types of information that are not currently on the directive but should fall on the directive, like cultural heritage institution information. So, John.
Thanks. Um, just forgive me as, um, as being a communion member asking a question to you guys, but it's such a good opportunity to have everyone on stage in one place. Um, what, what, what is your impression? Are there any strategies uh, that came up in our three years? Uh, how to overcome um, the forces that see scarcity as a, as a thing of value, both in, in, like in governments but also in universities? forces in the heads of people and also in the institutions that try to keep things out of the public domain because they want to keep the things uh, scarce and they don't want to give it to everyone, even though the transaction costs, uh, as Joey said, uh, have, have lowered uh, so much, but they, don't, they just don't want to give that up, the scarcity. Is there any strategy to overcome those, those forces? Uh, two quick points on that one uh, from a library perspective. If uh, libraries who have been lobbying for years and years to get budget to digitize their holdings and they don't get the money, then they, if somebody, a commercial provider, steps up and wants to do it for them, of course they have to give up some exclusive rights. But even those have become increasingly, like with uh, Munich and now the Austrians, I guess they have had a fairly good deal with Google, which is completely acceptable. But other vendors like ProQuest, for example, they really have a commercial model behind it to sell the content, produce very high quality digitization, and there's not an easy answer for that except uh, we want money, which is sort of the worst position to fall back upon at this time. And my other pragmatic approach would be that we need to demonstrate tangible benefits of opening up data. If we, if we can't do that, then there probably aren't any, and then the whole thing is a moot point. So you need to really focus on that from my point. Thanks. Thanks for that excellent question. I'd like to answer that from the point of view of, again, the context of uh, open educational resources. It was well established that it's a way for socioeconomic development of developing countries um, and it is a key to uh, coming up with their socioeconomic infrastructure to, to um, capitalize on knowledge. Um, so you have very progressive academics saying this uh, who want to share knowledge and then you're up against uh, rules and regulations that are not progressive to say the least. They're uh, leading the way to closing down YouTube, leading the way to closing down Google for their entire countries. So you have this amazing contrast between universities and others who ever in, are in charge. Um, so I don't know that we have a policy recommendation to come up with, but we know that universities do win in the end, or um, brains do win in the end, so that's all I wanted to say. Really briefly going to add to um, Patrick's point that um, basically I think in terms of compelling arguments one can make, um, one of the most compelling ones that I can think of is that sharing is the key to scaling. And by sharing your data, you have sort of these huge potential sort of uh, benefits in terms of the quality of the data and also its comprehensiveness. And for example, when it comes to, I mean, obviously it completely depends on the context, but um, for example, with uh, scientific research data, um, the Human Genome Project is a wonderful example of where, you know, they looked at different models and it turned out that having everyone share their data with everyone else was the best way to map the human genome quickly. Uh, similarly with environmental data, which is obviously you know, a fairly time critical thing, um, having different research institutes share their data with each other is the best way that we can quickly build a picture of, of you know, how, how the climate is changing and, and so on. And I think it's similar with um, cultural heritage information in, in, you know, up to a certain degree, like libraries sharing um, the updates to sort of bibliographic records with each other directly rather than kind of going through a, a centralized sort of commercial provider, looks to be an attractive sort of longer term model, I think. I think we would have time to, for one question. The last question. If nobody else, I take one more time the floor, sorry about that. Um, when you're advocating about uh, you know, open sharing, sometimes it's really to have a full transparency about everything. Let me take an educational example and that uh, choice you know, and the quality of schools. There is a huge debate about whether this information should be available to parents or not. 
and whether they should be allowed to make the uh, schooling decisions according to this publicly available information. Um, so I see big eyes. Let, shall I repeat or is it, uh, do you see? To, to whom is the question addressed more specifically? In general? Uh, uh, that would be probably um, the gentleman in the middle, but overall, you know, the transparency ideal. And my question in brief is, do you think that being always transparent is necessarily the best thing? Or are there some cases where you actually you shouldn't be open? Are there sometimes good reasons for that? I, I in general, would be very keen in all kinds of different fields to keep uh, very distinct the questions about whether information should be released and whether it should be made open. Um, so, for example, in uh, scientific research, the question of whether and, and under what terms data should be released are two very different questions. So, you know, for example, in genetics, should it be released in the first place is one question uh, you have on the one hand. And obviously there are cases where it's probably not a good idea to release the data for privacy reasons. Um, there's all kinds of other reasons why you might want to release sort of government information. On the other hand, once the data is released, um, I guess that's where you kind of, that's where the question of whether or not it should be made open begins really for me. Um, if you see what I mean. Um, I mean, obviously there are, there are sort of cases in the middle like uh, we've just come to the end of uh, sort of several years of campaigning for the release of, well, not really campaigning, asking nicely for the release of um, sort of information on UK government finance and that's finally come to fruition and they released this enormous kind of four or five gigabyte uh, data set I think a few weeks ago. Um, so that was a case where, you know, the information was not available, there were arguments that it shouldn't be made available on the basis of um, uh, third party intellectual property rights rather than privacy or anything like this, national security. Um, so I guess that was a case where, you know, um, but generally I think there, one would want to keep those two questions separate. You know, there is, there is a wonderful piece by Larry Lessig in The New Republic, uh, an, an article called Against Transparency, in which he uh, has a transparent promoter of better government and transparency, he raises the issue of what could be excessive transparency or excessive usage of what information you get through transparency. But there, I would say that when you define an open access or an open data policy, it's a very different situation than when just data is available. Uh, it's very, uh, I think it's, 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 there is a clear difference between everything you can find on the internet and amplify and uh, uh, retweet it and uh, things that have been the object of a, of a reflection by the, pr the producers of data on when to release it, uh, how to release it, which material, that methodology used uh, for producing the data uh, is available to accompany the data and, and uh, guide its interpretation or not. And uh, I think the consciousness of, uh, uh, of uh, public domain access and open data access uh, leads to, this, to a situation which let's say, lower the risk of uh, uh, an abusive usage of transparency or a paralysis of the ability of government to formulate policy, which, we, which could be a thing, you know, it's permanent observation when you can no longer take the, the, the step back to say, okay, I'm going to do things differently. While you are discussing that, I think government should be allowed the... Uh, the secrecy of its thinking room. Uh, but when the data, but the process that has led to the decision, the interaction with other and interest is a different, a different issue. Uh, so, and well, if there's nothing else, I think this closes the session. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you in particular to Lucy for, uh, in effect, chairing the session. Thank you so much. And um, if you're coming to the social dinner, see you later at the Castello del Valentino at 8. I want to uh, tell you that tomorrow morning we're going to start as planned as 9.30. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning of the conference that unfortunately David Bollier had to fly back to the US for personal reasons, but uh, uh, Professor Jean-Claude Guedon kindly uh, accepted our invitation to speak in his place. Thank you so much. So at 9.30, we'll start with a high-order bid talk by Professor Jean-Claude Guedon, and then we will go on with the keynote address by Bruce Sterling. Thank you, and thank you all.